All right, on my way home to make the intro for my video. All right, what's that noise? What is that noise? Are those cows big? Well, no intro, I guess. I recently made a video called The Curious Case of Dark Souls 2, and while that video is certainly not liked by everyone, the reason I said it was curious is because of how the game came together, how it strayed from what its sequel did, the absolutely polarizing discourse surrounding it, and how despite all that, it was still a fun game to play. And I wasn't ever planning on reusing titles for videos, at least not like that, because it makes me look lazy. And lazy, I am certainly not. But when looking at Dragon's Dogma 2, I don't think there's a more accurate word to describe everything about it and surrounding it since it released. It is a curious case. How the game's performance was launched the way it was, especially on console, which I played on and will get into. How the game surprise launched microtransactions that killed almost all momentum the game would have had upon launch. How the discourse around the game has gone in two completely opposite directions. And despite all that, it is still one of the most fun and memorable open world games I have ever played. And I am so happy that this once thought buried and forgotten IP is now getting the respect that in my opinion, it absolutely deserves. But like I said, the discourse at first went in two completely different directions. Now as people are finishing up their playthroughs, you're seeing more reasonable reviews out there. But at launch, people either hated it because of the microtransactions or thought it was a certified masterpiece, which, thank God, neither one looks like the prevailing sentiment anymore. Why are you writing an article after only three hours of play time? More importantly, why the hell did I click on it? You are made of stupid. I think one can talk about how disingenuous the mostly negative reviews on Steam are while saying that the game is great but has some clear flaws that become more evident the more you play. That's not unreasonable, right? What you say is heresy. But at the end of the day, after cutting through all the bullshit, what does Dragon's Dogma 2 bring to the table after its long hiatus, and does its adamant design choices make or break the game? Well, we better talk quick before that griffin shows up. So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. So before we get into the game... <sighs> We gotta cut through the bullshit. The microtransaction fiasco is a situation that will literally make you question life itself. I have the belief that many others have. Yes, microtransactions in a single player game are bad. No, it doesn't ruin the game. Every single thing sold here is stuff you can easily find in game. And some of the stuff you don't even need. Like this harpy lure. Why have a lure when you have the cloud strike? Everyone saying this stuff ruins the game hasn't actually played the game. I think we could just establish that right off the bat. However, having these in the game is still a terrible decision because this helps no one. Because of the fact that none of this stuff is essential, it just begs the question, why was this stuff even implemented in the first place? And more importantly, why was it surprise dropped on day one? Y you do realize that nobody wins from this, right? Because of its non-essential nature, you don't expect sales to be high because the majority of people don't need it. You end up looking like a scummy, money-hungry company. Because of the surprise drop, reviewers may or may not have known about it and didn't say anything, so now they look like shills and their reputation is called into question. And all of this takes away from the actual viral moments that the game makes. All of the focus should be on clips such as funny pawn deaths, cool monster third parties, cool discoveries, like all that stuff. But instead, here we are talking about how Capcom blindsided everybody with bullshit microtransactions. There is no winner from this, so then why would you do it? And by the way, it doesn't help that the game is designed around limited fast travel, your game director is on record saying less fast travel is a good thing, and meanwhile, you're selling port crystals for three bucks a pop. I don't care how much it does or doesn't affect the game, that is an awful look. It sucks because I don't think the actual developers wanted to put these in, rather the suits at the top did. And I can't understate how much of a disaster it is, despite the fact that, once again, it doesn't actually hurt the game. But this next part does, and the other big thing that has surrounded this game, the performance. Now I played on PS5, so I got an uncapped 30 FPS, while PC players were able to get 60 FPS. The problem is, uh, it stayed that way for about as long as the developers allotted time at the Game Awards. Get off the stage, Sam. Kojima wants to whisper something in my ear. Constant frame rate drops for PC players. Crashes galore at launch. How does this keep- I can't even get into the game! 
They released a patch that ironed some of it out, but since I didn't play on PC, I can't really say if it actually worked or not, so anyone who did, let me know in the comments. For console, there weren't many times that the frame rate dropped like a rock in water, because after all, can't drop like a rock in water if you're already a rock in water. There has been a debate that has cropped up about 30 FPS versus 60 FPS. Bullshit. I have a hard stance on this. It's 2024. If you can't get your game running at 60 FPS on the most powerful consoles that we have ever seen and consistently on PCs that are more powerful than the ones we use to send men to the moon, that is unacceptable. CPU, GPU, STFU. Do other open world games have this problem? No? Oh, well, I guess it's not a hardware problem. It's a you problem. There are times where it runs at decent 30, but then you get into a town and uh, the will of the people kick in. Funny enough, the game actually ran the smoothest when I was in the Rift Stone. The in-game graphics don't exactly look great either. The cutscenes look pretty good, but what the hell is this? Oh my goodness! I think if the game ran well, I would be able to look past it somewhat. And I have been on record saying that graphics are the last thing that gamers care about. And I stand by that. But it does become something I care about when it looks like it would barely pass as a launch title for the PS4. We're in 2024, if you didn't realize. I mean, you could splice in some sounds from Banjo-Kazooie and it wouldn't be out of place. <laughs> I'm not expecting photorealistic peach fuzz, but every generation comes with a standard, and this doesn't meet it. I expected something better in this department after 12 years, especially from a developer like Capcom, who has been on an absolute tear these past few years. But it only looks like a minor upgrade over the first game. Now, i rather have a game have great gameplay than great graphics, and even though the graphics should be better than they are, we certainly got that. When it comes to Dragon's Dogma 2, the gameplay and combat is still among the best and most unique in any RPG I've ever played. And now that it has more mainstream attention than the first game, I mean, good luck releasing any fantasy RPG within a year of Skyrim. It's good that people are finally seeing something other than a Souls-like can have success like this. It presents a different spin on the formula, and one I can really appreciate and sink my teeth into. Even before you get into the game, let's start with that. The character creator is way better than I thought it would be. Much more detailed than the first game, and I've already seen people making characters from other games, including myself. <laughs> Say hello to Star Scourge Radon, or at least... Dollar store version? Uh, honey, <laughs> we have Radon at home. Before we get into the pawn system, I don't think that's even the best part about Dragon's Dogma. That goes to the vocation system. Being able to pick up a class at the start of a game and being able to change it whenever you want is the best sort of freedom you can have in a game like this. And you don't even need to worry about progression because you could pick right up where you left off with your previous vocation. So there's no penalty at all for switching. As with many RPGs, different builds work better in different situations and you may be comfortable with your current build, but eventually the world may shove that comfortability right up your ass. Take for instance this dragon. The entire game I was playing as a basic fighter because parrying these fools is just satisfying. And the cloud strike is just an absolute force of nature. And I can basically block any hit from any monster, so you could say I was loving life. But when it came to the dragon... Uh, that didn't really work out so well. So I figured, how can I target these tumors? Easy. Become an archer. Face the wrath of the arisen, you plebe! You got your basic classes like the first game also had, with Strider splitting into archer and thief, some intermediate classes like warrior and sorcerer, and advanced classes that only you can equip, including this completely new vocation called trickster, which is great if you really don't like actually fighting. <laughs> what is my pawn doing? Dude, get back over here. It utilizes misdirection and smoke screens to call enemies onto you. And this is very ballsy considering the smoke draws enemies towards a person whose weapons doesn't actually do damage. But it's okay, we're done with this class. I will not feel comfortable not doling out punishment myself. Throughout the game, I used Fighter, Archer, Trickster, Magic Archer, and Mystic Spearhand. Each with their own skills. The Mystic Spearhand is way more powerful than I thought it would be. I mean, I was a Mystic Knight in the first game, but that just gave me the power to use two different weapons. This gives me the ability to negate any damage, become a Rail Cannon, and my personal favorite, Home Run Derby. <laughs> This game is amazing. Eventually you get the vocation Warfarer, which allows you to wield any type of weapon and any armor type and any skills you want. And its specific class skill allows you to switch between different weapons during combat, but only calculates the weapon that weighs the most towards your equipment load. 
Truly, this is the ultimate vocation. I absolutely love this system, and I hope future RPGs do something like this. But this doesn't work without the pawns. Your AI companions that blindly follow you, no questions asked. Even if it means that they may not do the smartest things. Uh, are, are you actually planning on flying towards that pillar? Cause, yep, yeah, of course not. Or if you're in the middle of a raid and your pawn casually decides to completely destroy the ox cart. Oh, that's real nice. Your main pawn is also fully customizable, which given that I was Radon, I tried to have Melania on board. It didn't go so well. So, uh, say hello to Yennefer. It actually makes more sense for what I'm doing. She is a kind-hearted mage, which immediately erased any need I had for healing items, for the most part. And she imbues my weapons with the fury of the elements, even though it may be completely wrong sometimes. The Saurian weakness is ice, so of course she gives me fire. You had one job, Yen. No matter how many times I jumped off the roof like a dumbass, Yennefer was always there for me. Even though her mind isn't always there. Follow me. I will guide you to the location. Genius plan, Yen. Thing. One of my former uh, masters hey, chose Yen? to hire only uh, women. <laughs> you getting I those extra steps in? <laughs> Fascinating. Now, I know what you're thinking. Zidi, why is your pawn wearing a revealing outfit? Well, that is a long story. Your pawn can, of course, be summoned by other players, and when they dismiss them, they can give your pawns different items. I just give the best gifts. I mean, what do you expect? I am a guy who tips two bucks on a $40 restaurant bill, but other players can also send actual equipment. One of which was the outfit she is currently wearing. And I was gonna change it before I would be judged unnecessarily, but it turns out... It's got better defense. You can now also send your pawns on quests when they are summoned by another player. Things like killing Cyclops or acquire fairy stones. And when your pawn completes them, you get different rewards. Brilliant change of the subject. <laughs> Along with your main pawn, you once again get two other pawns that you can summon from Rift Stones, each with their own class and unique names. Now, in the beginning, I wasn't seeing a lot of unique characters. Like, get your shit to get. Oh my god, Daenerys? L literally Jason Momoa. <laughs> what? <laughs> and as a unique pawn, Asmongold? Demon Souls was a fucking joke game. It was super easy. What, I died once on <laughs> This is just too good. It. It'll take some fine tuning of your party to get your right combination down. For me, I personally went with Mage, Sorcerer, and Warrior because I tried using the Warrior class, but for me, it was way too slow. Like, dude, can you pick up the pace, please? So we constantly rolled up with two magic users and the actual definition of a cleaner. It was at this moment that he knew. He fucked up. Like, this dude puts in work, holy shit. The system also reminds you that sometimes you don't always need to be the hero because you may run into an enemy that your class cannot do anything to. So, hey, just sit back and let the magic girls handle this. Ah, uh, they grow up so fast. But of course, the pawns aren't just used for combat. They're used for exploration. Now, this game is automatically better than the first one, mainly because in that one, the pawns would not shut up. My support. Here, the pawns still talk a lot of the time, but it's an actual conversation. I'd wager there's all to be found here. Let us ponder how best to proceed. Another statue. Walk within me yearns to climb it. I can foresee no reason not to go see it up close. I actually like this a lot because it feels like we're actually on a journey and nobody's spending their journey in silence. 
But it also doesn't sound like everyone in the back seat is shouting their Wendy's order at me while I'm still in the drive through line. Throughout the game, they'll pick up resources for you, give you helpful tips, and most notably, if you're doing a quest, and they already did the quest in another person's world, they will offer to lead you in the right place. Or if they know of a cave or a treasure chest nearby, they'll offer to lead you to that too. This is an amazing feature since a lot of the quests in Dragon's Dogma are open-ended. So that feeling when you get a quest with no map markers and one of your pawns is like, oh, Arisen, I know exactly where we need to go. I've also seen clips online of people using their pawns to jettison themselves with a certain ability. I've also seen a certain condition. I'll let you figure it out. The game also has its quirks like the weight management system, which can fill up pretty easily. Most likely the designer's way of showing the player that you can distribute your inventory out to each of your pawns to make it easier, but it still can get tiring after a while, and your health slowly decreasing with every hit and death you take, where you need to rest at a campfire or- Oh my- Oh my god, that, that's a real steak. That, that steak's real. That steak is real. So now that the gameplay is sorted out, the real reason why you came to Dragon's Dogma 2 was to explore this world. So, how is it? It's great. When I played the first game back in the day, I wasn't really a fan because of the fact that Dragon's Dogma's design philosophy is centered around limited fast travel, and I had no patience to try and look past it. Nowadays, I'm older and much more tolerant of systems like this. Even before the game came out, I went back and played the first game to prepare myself for two. And let me tell you, there is a real benefit to an open world that features limited fast travel. Mainly, anything can happen on your journey. Um, excuse me? And that is where the world of Dragon's Dogma 2 shines. I mean, it's already an upgrade over the first game for its map alone. Anyone who tells you that the first game's fogged map was good is lying to you. Good luck figuring out the spaghetti noodle you gotta follow to get to here. But here, the noodles are faint on the undiscovered map, so you could see a clear route to take and not waste time bungling down the wrong area. The one word I have heard people say about this game is it's unapologetic. The game is unapologetic in its design. It is designed to encourage exploration. No, 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 no. It's not designed to encourage exploration. It's designed to force exploration. It doesn't give you a choice. The only bits of fast travel you have are the ox carts in between certain cities that are highly likely to be raided at night, and port crystals which are available in two of the starting cities, and more you find while doing side quests. I only found two in my entire 50 plus hours of playing. There's definitely more, I just haven't gotten to it. Once again, you use ferry stones to travel to and from. Pretty hefty price in the beginning. But for the most part, you are gonna be hiking away with your good old pals and are gonna be stopped many times along the way, and sometimes someone might wanna join you. Oh fuck. You'll never know what you'll encounter in the world of Dragon's Dogma. One minute it's all quiet, the next you're getting ambushed by goblins, you find an elemental in the world and start fighting him off, then all of a sudden a griffin just shows up right next to him. We're not surviving this, are we? The world is truly dangerous, and you have no choice but to brave through it. Especially at night, where not only do you have the regular monsters on the road, but you also got skeletons and wraiths that I never engage with. I just let my pawns do the work for that one. In terms of these bosses, these still rule. Shadow of the Colossus and Monster Hunter would be proud. Though I guess they'll be disappointed in you. Stumbling onto one of these creatures randomly and then seeing your party spring into action will never not be a sight to behold. The fights are still as dynamic as ever. Most of the time they'll start off at their normal speed, but as the fight lingers on, the monster actually gets more weary and slow, which this is gonna sound weird given it's a fantasy game, is more realistic. No monster has unlimited stamina, and the more you wear them down, the easier the fight gets. Unless you're fighting the elemental, in which case... Game. You also have different ways you can approach the fight. Since I had a mage, I always just waited for the monsters to be burning alive because That's a lot of damage. Pro tip for Dragon's Dogma 2, use fire. That is all. But you can also climb up onto them and stab at their weak spots like their head or the Cyclops eyeball. Or when you got a Cyclops that has a protective shield around it, you can cut the chains to make it fall off. And when the monsters fall down, you get that incredibly satisfying ground stab. These are the best moments of the game by far, and that victory theme will never get old. Oh, and did I mention, these monsters can follow you into the cities? Ah, what a nice day in Vernworth. I'm sorry, what?
Uh, the world is also filled up with a bunch of secrets. Hitting caves with cool loot, uh, half the time. I'll just let my pawn say this for me. It isn't worthless, but that's as much as I can say for it. Rarely have I felt so empty. There's also interesting locations you can find on your own. Like, I stumbled onto the Sacred Arbor completely by accident and had no idea what anyone was saying, so I had to find a pawn that spoke Elvish. There's a literal monster trail above Checkpoint Rest Town. Apparently, there's a Sphinx that you could find if you're clever enough. It feels like I haven't even scratched the surface of what this world has to offer, and I played 50 plus hours of this thing. All of this just works. Until it doesn't. Here is where you and me may diverge, but the design philosophy of Dragon's Dogma 2 is a double-edged sword that is exacerbated by the biggest problem I have with this game. There is a severe lack of enemy variety. In terms of basic enemies, you got goblins, goblins that do 40-foot broad jumps, saurians, dogs, these rock boys, bandits, and three different types of harpies during the day. Now that may not sound so bad when I'm saying it to you, but these different enemy types are spread out all over this massive world, and a lot of the time, the only guys you will run into are goblins and one harpy type. If you've played the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And in terms of boss variety, well, epic and a blast to fight, there's not a lot. You got cyclops, ogres, minotaurs, griffins, and drakes. And these are the most common monsters you'll see. And the more you encounter and defeat them, the less satisfying it becomes. There's two other ones I saw, like I encountered only one chimera throughout the game, and this one super wraith, and I was like, yes, yes, what are those guys? I wanna see more of these things. But all of this bleeds into the traversal itself, because in the beginning of the game, and even part of the mid game, I actually liked walking to my far off destination because it meant that something cool and unexpected might happen, or I might find some interesting cave with some cool loot. And I had no problem walking down the same path a second or even a third time. But then you get the fourth time, and the fifth time, and the sixth time. And it's like, bro, do I really need to walk down the same path again? Fight these same super birds again? Fend off these goblins again? And the novelty of even this starts to wear off regardless. Like, remember when I found the Sacred Arbor by myself? Well, after that, I traveled back to Vernworth and started a quest with this elf here where I had to travel back. Ugh, all right, let's go. Because when you have to take these treks back to places you already were, you aren't really surprised by anything anymore because you've already seen it. Sure, a monster may show up that you didn't see before, but this is where the point connects to the bosses. It's a boss that you will probably have already seen three or four times already. Even with the bigger boys, I think we could all agree the first time you fight and kill a griffin after he's been harassing your underleveled self in vermin is one of the most satisfying feelings you will have for the entire game. But the fourth time, it's like, ah, oh, all right, gotta kill this guy again. Same thing with the dragons, although those are much more rare and take much more effort to kill. You know, unless... Hey, I bring a message from Hawkeye Goff! <laughs> now, I've seen an opinion online, I can't remember who exactly said it, but they brought up the idea of Dragon's Dogma 2 having some roguelike elements where the enemies and enemy layout change every time you go back to keep things fresh. And honestly, I'm all for that because that would prevent everything from getting stale. Would they be actually able to implement it without everything closing in on itself? I don't know, but I know one thing. If the enemies weren't exactly the same in most of the roads I've traveled, and there's a possibility that another surprise may come up, or there was a ton more monster variety, I would be much more willing to travel those same roads again and again and take those risks. But unfortunately for me, the more I played and the stronger my party got, exploring stopped surprising me. And because of that, exploring started to feel like a chore which is a shame when that is the core focus of your open world game. And I think the designers knew this would happen too, because fairy stones cost an arm and a leg, and you can't really get a lot in the beginning of the game, but by the end, you'll have so much money that you could buy every single one in stock at most of these vendors. Almost like they admitted, okay, this is probably gonna get old after a while, let's just give it to them. But all right, exploring the world is great for the most part. But I'm sure there's a story here that could- I enjoy tackling Oh my god, dude, I didn't ask. I'm sure there's a story here that could keep me engaged and make me want to keep playing, right? Yeah, about that. I'm not even going to bother putting a spoiler warning here because there's really nothing monumental to spoil with the story of Dragon's Dogma 2. I mean, let's be real. Now, did anyone watching this video come to Dragon's Dogma 2 for the story? No. 
Did anybody love the story the first game had? No. That should set the backdrop of how we view this story. The premise is still incredibly interesting. You are the Arisen, a person who impressed an ancient dragon so much that he actually steals your heart and binds himself to you. And now you have to forget all that, and now you gotta uncover some royal scheme to take over power or something like that. Wait, can I just go find and kill the dragon? No, we need you to bring peace to these nations. Sir, I have no blood flow. I'm just gonna say it. Hate me or not, this story is abysmal, and the storytelling might be even worse. I know I just said how we view the story, but even still, how can you take a world as vast and as interesting as this and somehow make a story that doesn't have a single compelling thing about it? I did not care once about anything that was happening. Oh, what, an imposter arisen is on my throne and there's unrest among the ranks to find the true arisen? Oh, okay. Then why the hell is seemingly everyone in the kingdom on my side? Even the son of the queen consort herself wants to put me on. I feel like we have enough to implement a pretty successful coup here. Do I have any enemies in the kingdom? No? Oh, there's a dark sorcerer in league with the false arisen that wants to revive the dragon? Oh, okay. Then why do we barely see this guy throughout the game? To, you know, to try and make him feel like a true threat? You know, like we do with every single villain in every piece of media? Really nice political conflict we got here between Vermin and Batal. It's a shame that, uh, we don't see any evidence that these guys are even in conflict. At all. Like, not even one official chews out a messenger or something? Like, we can't even do that right? Why does everyone I talk to in the game feel like the most boring person on the planet? As decreed by the great will of our world, there can only be one Arisen. That Arisen now resides within the palace. Indeed, he is our sovereign and the rightful ruler of Vermont. Wake the fuck up! It certainly doesn't help that the game has zoomed in in-engine dialogue sections with terrible looking character models that spout nothing but boring exposition at me, if not just telling me, oh, thank you, Arisen. We would have been done for if not for you. Or, gods above, that queen is a true bitch. I'm gonna give you a tip. This camera angle you see in RPGs work when your main character has the option to respond in conversations. You know, to still give the feeling like two people are actually talking to each other, but when you can almost never respond and you never see your character model for the majority of the time you're in these sections, how am I supposed to be engaged by this? I'm not asking the game to have a Witcher 3 level story or dialogue, but for the love of God, can something interesting happen here? I've heard people say the lore of this game is incredible. Show it to me, please. Please somebody tell me of this interesting lore. I'm begging you. What's worse, I've even seen some people who love the game tiptoe around the fact that the story isn't good, not calling anybody out specifically. Like, guys, just say it. I mean, the rest of the game is great. I think you can concede this one thing. And also, don't give me this. The true story of Dragon's Dogma is the moments you make along your journey. Fuck that! You're an RPG. If you don't have an interesting story and no cryptic but enchanting lore to compensate for that, then what the hell are you even doing here? You can't just be a cool open world. You know what that makes you? A survival game. The side quests are a little bit better. There were some cool ones I did, like I had to help a sculptor make a model of a griffin, but in order to do that, I actually had to fight him, which is funny because he's probably over there like, hey, hey, can you move the, the two feet to the right and uh, get it? Uh, perfect, stay right there. Uh, buddy, you can't really just stop here. There was also one involving the plot to murder the Empress of Batal, which I failed twice, but luckily I just reloaded my save because I just so happened to rest at an inn before coming here. Oh, is that the reason you only wanted people to have one save file? <laughs> I had to bring a bunch of dark tomes to a vendor in Batal to help him see better, but it actually just ended up turning his family into sand and he decided to skip town permanently. Shit, I really need a fairy stone. And I also had to help this one nun cure for sick patients, but as you investigate further, you realize she's actually poisoning them, which these side quests can have little cool storylines like that, but even during these quests, they mostly involve, hey, can you bring me these items? Or, hey, can you take this letter to somebody? Or, hey, can you find this person in a random town and tell him I said this? It's like, it's better, but the bar's not set very high. Again, I wasn't expecting much, but I at least expected to be engaged with the story a little bit. And I never even came close to it. That is a major, major problem. 
So wrapping all of this up in a nice little bow, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game that has its faults, but despite that, I truly think this has the potential to be an RPG standard bearer with a little more work and polish. This world, these monsters, the secret this world has to offer, you're gonna have trouble finding an RPG that feels this immersive. And that is precisely why I think Dragon's Dogma 2 is a curious case, because this game should be a masterpiece, it has everything it needs to be a masterpiece. And hell, it has everything needed to be Game of the Year this year. The highs of Dragon's Dogma 2 are some of the highest highs I've ever seen in gaming. But the effect the lack of enemy variety has on everything hold it back from being gameplay perfection. While the story is completely phoned in, there's nothing better to describe it. And it should have absolutely taken over video game discourse in a massive way but not the way it did with the performance issues and the dumbass microtransactions. I think Capcom should learn from this, and I hope they do, because the foundation is already strong as hell, and now this IP finally has the respect and attention it deserves. This should be Capcom's flagship RPG going forward, and if they put their mind to it and genuinely strive to improve the formula, then Dragon's Dogma 3, when we get it, will be that masterpiece that it should be. But do not get me wrong, Dragon's Dogma 2, I see this as an absolute win. You never thought you would see it, but now you do. Dragon's Dogma 2 gets an 8 out of 10.